You know I've been talking about earned media value for quite some time on this podcast. My friends at Eisenberg have just raised the bar on earned media benchmarks with their social index. Social Index now gives you globally earned media values across a growing list of six geographies for all your KPIs across the top seven social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can now visualize these values for deeper analysis, and they have a look-back window over two years of historical comparisons. Social Index is updated daily. Don't get stuck with old data. Over 1,000 companies have used the social index to understand the ROI of their social campaigns. And if you work with a social agency, you should demand they incorporate earned media values into your reports. Get your earned media value for social content. Visit earnedmediavalues.com. Again, that's earnedmediavalues.com. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. On the show today, I've got Jennifer Fromer. Jennifer is the Senior Vice President of Creative Content and Brand Partnerships at Columbia Records, which is a part of Sony Music. On the show today, we talk about how she broke into the music industry, the partnerships and brand partnerships she's worked on, which include things like Beats Headphones, musicians like Little Nas X, Beyonce, Adele, Pharrell, and many others, as well as her brand partnerships that include companies like Tiffany & Company, Jaguar, Taco Bell, Pepsi, Samsung, Microsoft, Google, and many others. We talk about brand partnerships and collaborations, how they work, uh, what works best for brands, how to work with artists, and how those artist collaborations come together. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jennifer Fromer. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. We've got a lot to talk about in terms of brand partnerships and content, but I know you've been working with Little Nas X from pretty early on in his career. And I mean, he's become a superstar, a megastar. I'm curious, has he has he changed from the first time you met him to now? That's a really great question. Um, and he's really the same kid that he was when I met him three, let's say three and a half years ago when he was creating music on his sister's couch, starting with Old Town Road and becoming the superstar that he is today. And there, I have two little quick little stories I'd love to share about him. One is going all the way back, and I referenced this in my article on LinkedIn, we shot a segment, a branded content segment for Panera in my apartment. I mean, that's how sort of, you know, that's going way back that we were actually doing shoots in my apartment. And I have a really cute cat. And my cat came out to say hello, and Naj tried to pick her up. And cats, you know, are finicky, and she wasn't giving him the time of day. And he said, don't you know who I am? I have the number one song in the world. How could you treat me like this? <laughs> and then a year and a half later, we were shooting the Doritos Super Bowl commercial. And the first thing he says to me is, how's your cat, Jen? How's your cat doing? I can't believe she's the only person that wouldn't give me the time of day. So he went from shooting a, a commercial in my apartment to shooting a Super Bowl commercial, and he's still asking about my cat, which I think is just goes to show you who he is, that he remembers things like that. And then lastly, just about a week ago, um, he was performing at Rolling Loud here in the city at City Field, and he, he jumped on stage and did a surprise performance with Jack Harlow for his track, Industry Baby, and I wanted to go say hi to him backstage. And by the time I got to him, he was in his van, about in the Sprinter van, about to leave, and it was mob, crazy fans screaming, trying to get to him. And big, burly security guards, usually I know his guys, but I didn't know these guys. And I was trying to say hi, and they were getting a little physically and pushing me out of the way. And he was like, what? Stop it. I want to see her. Jen, Jen. And the, the seas parted. And I went to go see him. He gave me a huge hug. He's like, don't treat her that way. Then the security guards apologized profusely to me for not taking care of me. So I think that shows, you know, starting out just as like this really adorable kid that, you know, is just trying to get his art out to, to, to start him, how he just remembers people along the way and even remembers small details like a cat. I mean, I think that that says a lot about the kind of guy he is. 
definitely makes him, you know, he's, he's just an everyday person. It sounds like <laughs> he remembers your, your cat in your apartment. How did you get to where you are? You know, you're a uh, senior vice president of creative content and brand partnerships at Columbia records. How do you get to that role? Well, to make a very long story short, um, I always wanted to work in music. I had the bug, the music bug. I was a musician. I was in a lot of bands and I just, it was always my dream to work in music. I ended up working in advertising in my first sort of uh, professional capacity and I became almost like a creative IT person. So in the advent of, you know, back in the day when everything was moving from analog to digital, I was the person that would set up all the creatives max and learn how to do animated storyboards and things like that. So I went back to school to NYU and I got my master's in um, interactive telecommunication, which in the day is just a fancy word for digital stuff, if you will. And I got my degree under my belt. And then I actually started cold calling every record company in the city. I was 25 and I was, I was calling like CEOs and presidents of labels. And I was saying, hi, I'm a multimedia executive in advertising looking to make a change to music, which <laughs> I really wasn't, but that's what, that was my line. So I started the company's first fully functioning uh, digital division And my role was to go around literally the world and teach our artists how to, again, go from analog to digital. I've always been a bit of an evangelist. I got my chops in production, really doing a lot of making of content during the first dot-com boom. And then from there, I, I realized quickly that I needed to learn how to do deals, not just content and production. Even though like I knew how to code and I was pretty technically proficient, I thought I don't know how to do any kind of deal type work. So I then moved over to the media side and I've had several stints in Condé Nast at Spin Magazine. Um, I was at, worked at Condé Nast twice and I learned how to put packages and deals together. Then from there, I went to Interscope and I worked for Jimmy Iovine, which is where I really learned the business of music. And I helped Jimmy launch Beats. I worked with stars like Eminem and Lady Gaga and the Black Eyed Peas at the time. And I really learned how to work with a really incredible music man and executive. And then from there, I moved over and uh, and, and I've been at Columbia now for five years. It's quite the journey. We could talk about a lot of those stops. Uh, we may have to have you come back on this show, talk about beats and things like that that I don't even have on my, on my question list today. Um, but you're managing deals and brand partnerships today. What, what are some, some examples of things that you've worked on? Let's see. I've done so many. I, I don't even really know where to begin. Um, we can talk about something that, as far as Lil Nas X goes, I've done all of his branding deals. So starting out doing, as I mentioned, a, a little cute little Panera partnership for the VMAs that we shot in my apartment because his song was called Panini. So we did something called Panera, Panera Panini where we surprised and delighted a fan right in my apartment, which was really fun. I also, and I can give a couple more examples, but I also want to point out, and I talk about this often, that I refer to myself sometimes as the queen of product placement because I've probably orchestrated and produced probably close to a thousand integrations and music videos across time. And interesting little uh, tidbit yesterday, a good friend of mine from years and years ago, who's now in charge of brand Oreo, was at Miracle Whip. And this takes me back to my Interscope days, but Lady Gaga for her video telephone with Beyonce had a very, very specific brand and aesthetic in mind for that video where she wanted to have a, do a miracle whip dance where she would create uh, a sandwich that was created especially for miracle whip and created dance to go with miracle whip taking it a step further she wanted to pick up the colors of miracle whip and style most of the costumes in the video in those miracle whip you know those really poppy bright colors and so found someone at craft, cold called them, got through. And uh, we ended up doing an incredible integration with Miracle Whip. And um, it was funny. So yesterday, you know, people move around, you stay in touch with, you know, folks that you do great work with. And my friend who was, you know, put that together for me back in the day with that video is now in charge of everything at Oreo. We still, every time we talk, like, can you believe we did that? So I think that's a really good example of creative organic integration. That's a great example. I, like, how does something like that even come about? I mean, was that artist driven? That example of Lady Gaga, it, it sounds like it was, and she she was like she had this vision in her head, and it was just a natural inclination to go figure out from the brand whether this was possible. 
Yes, it was completely artist driven. And that's when we do our best work. And I can share a little bit about the little Nas X Taco Bell campaign that we're still in the middle of, you know, creating more and more for Um, that started because Lil Nas X worked at Taco Bell when he was a kid growing up in Atlanta. And it's where he first learned his first, you know, the first way to, to be responsible, to have a job, to have pocket money. And he comes up with all of his treatments, all of his ideas. He's just, a, he's such a creative genius. And so when he knew he wanted to do the video for Sun Goes Down, which is an autobiographical tale, he wanted to shoot at Taco Bell and he wanted Taco Bell to almost be a featured character in the video. And so we reached out to Taco Bell again, cold reached out, didn't really know anybody, but you call and you say you're calling on behalf of Lil Nas X and we'd love to shoot at your restaurant and figure out more things we can do. And from a video integration, became the big partnership that we have now where he's, you know, he's been given a C-suite title at Taco Bell, chief impact officer. You know, he's going to be bestowing scholarship money to worthy recipients who want to fulfill their artistic dreams. And it's really become an incredible partnership, but it started out very authentically in the scope that that was a brand that he almost wanted to pay homage to. What is the, like the current state of, branded partnerships, if you will, or collaborations, like what's new, what's emerging. You talk about product placement, like actually a a product living inside of a song or a video or something of that nature. But what, what else are people doing now? I have to tell you that I'm really fascinated by what's going on in the crypto meta NFT space. I'm studying it. Like, I feel like I'm like a little student again. I'm trying to just absorb as much as I can go to panels, podcasts, et cetera. We're working on a few right now um, whereby, you know, it really is an incredible way for an artist to get very close to their fans. It's a one-on-one relationship that they can tap into in a very innovative and almost unbelievable way. So we're really leaning into that a great deal. I love how traditional brands are approaching entertainment in a new way. For example, the way the Balenciaga did their entire fashion show as a Simpsons episode. I mean, that's just nuts. So, uh, and, and also Valenciaga, again, created characters and dressed them in a version of Fortnite and sold their digital goods with Balenciaga characters outfitted in Balenciaga gear. That's amazing. If you think about it, Uh, we've gone from physical to digital and virtual worlds. The whole Web 3.0 and or Web 3 and um, NFTs and blockchain, like I, I'm also going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> and it really is like a rabbit hole, meaning like it's actually hard to conceptualize sometimes like what's possible in that realm. Meaning, you know, you, you got you have the NFTs, which I think most people can kind of understand. And you've got cryptocurrency, which kind of makes sense, too. But then you start to go further and um, I start to get way outside of my skill set and understanding. But, you know, where essentially these are like self-governing apps. There's a way for creators to continuously make a steady stream of income in the future. It's kind of crazy to, to think about. It's crazy. I'm listening to a lot of podcasts about it and people are arguing about, you know, where, how things live. You hear the word provenance a lot. What's legit? People are, there's like schemes. It's like a whole crazy world. So I'm really trying to learn it. I think nothing's been done quite yet because we're all experimenting, which is amazing. So it's a good time to go out and test and learn. How do brand partnerships actually work for brands? Like what does success look like for a brand? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you'll get different answers from different brands. But the way I would answer it is that whatever moves the needle for the brand, brands may have different touch points that they need to hit, right? Sometimes maybe it's the release of a new product. Sometimes it's more subscribers to, you know, their various channels. Sometimes it's exposure. Sometimes it's just about adding a level of cultural currency and coolness to that brand. An example I can speak about last year is we did a fantastic campaign with Tyler, the creator and Coca-Cola. And The reason why Coca-Cola knew that they needed to work with an artist like Tyler was because obviously these sugar sugar drinks, sugar cereals, et cetera, are kind of losing favor with kids, with Gen Z. And I was really proud of how brave they were because Tyler can be a bit polarizing. 
but it's not like you're picking Taylor Swift, for example, to work with. Right. He's much more of an edgy artist, if you will. And Coke really believed in him and understood his vision and chose him because they knew that he would add credibility to the brand. And Tyler got so, so the, the brief was for Tyler to create a song, um, an original song to run through the campaign and to be part of a digital film. Tyler got so into the creative process that he ended up scoring the entire commercial or film from start to finish. So he created a 10 minute piece of music that you know ultimately was cut up into 60s and 30s for, for TV. But the art that he created to go with the with the creative that the brand had already put together was truly groundbreaking and so spectacular. And he it really made a difference for the brand. And I would say that in this instance, perhaps the success wasn't measured by how many cans or bottles of Coke they sold, but more about, you know, the cultural currency that Tyler brought to the campaign. I'd love to demystify the process. Like how does a brand partnership work from kind of start to finish? How how long is this process, if that makes sense? Um, I'd love to give give you the floor just to kind of take us through what does it look like? Honestly, sometimes we do things in one day. If it's perhaps a music video or a content integration or a sponsorship of a party, we can do that in one day. If it's a larger activation, like the Taco Bell campaign, actually that came together pretty quickly. But I'd say the range is really between, for, for a large 360 program, I would say that the lifespan is, you, it probably takes about two months to kind of ideate, get it right, sell it through to the artist, make sure everybody's in agreement, and then you have to execute after that. I mean, that's really not that long. If I think about it, it's actually pretty short for some of these big corporations to be able to act on. Do you feel like they need to be primed and ready to go when they come talking to artists and folks like yourself? Absolutely. It's really difficult <laughs> because we're coming from two different places, right? It's like we're speaking two different languages. Brands plan out years in advance. And we can be told that Tyler's got a new album coming a week before he's ready to drop it. There's a disconnect between the timing is always is often hard, but you somehow you have to make it work. I will say that when it's an artist that everybody wants to work with, like Lil Nas X, allowances can be made for timing. If I'm pitching a developing artist and the artist has new material that's dropping in a couple of weeks or a month, a brand isn't that predisposed to move mountains in order to work with them. Do you tend to work direct with the brands or you find yourself working with agencies or media companies in between? Sort of all over the map. Um, we work with brands. We work with creative agencies. We also work... My best work to date, I think, has either been from the brand side or the creative agency side, sort of like the old-fashioned advertising agency, but on the creative side, art directors, creative, CCOs, et cetera. But there's also a lot of entertainment companies. You're asking about what's new in the inter in the brand partnership space. It's not new. It's just becoming a, a lot more prevalent where there are small entertainment firms that will have a couple of clients and they manage all of their entertainment business for them. We talked a little bit about the process it can be quick you need to be ready and we talked about these large mega celebrities uh you mentioned up and coming artists what does that look like and and what's in it for brands it's a lot of education when it relates to the developing artists and it's definitely a nut that i am always striving to crack um, sometimes you get lucky sometimes you don't and it's kind of on both sides you know that an artist is really going to explode because we see all the signs. For example, we knew that Lil Nas X was going to be as big as he's going to be because we have so many indicators internally, so much data based on, you know, streams, views, concert tickets, radio airplay. Like we can really, we can put together a very compelling package as to why an artist is going to be on the rise. But sometimes brands just don't have the courage, like they just don't want to um, make that leap until an artist is as big as Adele or Lil Nas X or Beyonce, or what have you. It's a matter of education and trust. Something that I've been working on that I, again, I've yet to crack it quite yet. Another thing I want to work on this ne for next year is figuring out how we can take our artists, maybe it's several at a time of the developing artists and creating a program with them. There's always like packages that you could sell. Like it would be sort of like a a teen night, or it's not a good example, but we created something at Spin actually called Spin House Live. And we had really cool indie artists perform in the offices. This is the beginning of live streaming. 
bands like the Strokes, the Hives, really cool bands on the rise. And um, we would get brands to come in and sponsor that more so, you know, like an independent artist series. And I think publishers are still doing a good job of that. I think Billboard does it a lot. I think Rolling Stone does. We, and, and you know what? They're just coming to us for our talent. <laughs> so why aren't I doing it myself? So that's something I'd love to try to figure out how to do because I think it would check a lot of boxes. We would find funding, opportunity, exposure for our artists, and then a brand could, you know, get a seat at the table while the artist is growing. That's a really good idea. And I, I know during the pandemic in particular, they, a lot of the smaller up and coming artists, they couldn't tour, right? And so they started getting really inventive. I follow a, f- a few myself and we're selling tickets to little private Facebook, you know, gatherings, <laughs> if you will, and other types of little micro concerts, which was highly engaging. Do you feel like there are any brands out there today that have like a an up and coming music program like i'm old but i think of like i don't know when this was like back in the 90s or maybe even earlier than that but like gap used to have some association with up-and-coming artists but i can't think of many today which is, is kind of sad frankly well i can tell you one that has done a great deal of work in that space which is arizona iced tea during right. the pandemic in particular but the artists are so small that it kind of doesn't move the needle. You know, I know that they were really trying and they were trying to get, I've spoke to them a lot and it's it's not a huge brand, obviously, but I know that that was definitely something that they were looking to do and looking to, you know, I've seen other brands kind of become, or like thinking about like a patron of the arts where they want to give money for touring. Taco Bell does it a lot, actually. I I actually, I I stand corrected. I'm not just saying this because I love my Taco Bell partners. (laughs) They have something called Feed the Beat, which has been in existence for a very long time. And what they've done is they've put artists, uh, they, they actually, you know, donate money and maybe studio time and maybe provide tour buses, stuff like not don't, you know, don't call me, it's not exactly it, but something like that whereby they support up and coming artists. And sometimes if it works out really well, the artist's music can even end up being in Taco Bell commercials. Yeah, that's a great example. We talked about like brands, you know, needing to kind of like think differently about speed first and foremost. We talked about timing, but what are some other keys to success for a brand and an artist collaboration? For an artist and a brand to be successful, it has to really feel authentic and legitimate and it has to feel like the artist is going to wear those clothes or drink this beverage or you know believe in what the brand has to say because if there's such a strong disconnect then it just doesn't feel authentic i mean i'll give another example although i don't know anything about it but what i will say is the way that kim and kanye are dressed head to toe in balenciaga for everything that that, that he's doing is genius to me and, and again like i don't know what the arrangement is i have I don't speak to any of these people, but I watch it and I'm sure everybody does. I'm like, well, geez, that makes a ton of sense, right? It's like the right look. It's the right aesthetic for both of them. It's 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 very unexpected the way they're showing up in in these incredible bodies of work that, that Balenciaga has created. So I feel like that that to me is a really good example of authenticity. Now, again, as I said, I want to caveat that with, I don't know if it's a brand partnership or they're just, you know, wearing really cool clothing that's been created for them and Kanye's on a whole other level. But, um, you know, based on, you know, everything I've worked on in my life, if the artist isn't into doing it and they're not into the brand and conversely, if the brand doesn't appreciate who they have, I'll I'll harken back to my Tyler example, Coca-Cola knew what they had. They knew they had a genius on their hands and they were willing to abide by how he wanted to partner. The artist has to be into the brand and the brand has to be into the artist. Otherwise it's just not going to, it's not going to work. It seems like the brand really needs to, this may sound like a, the wrong word to use if you're on the artist side, but like the brand really needs to have some courage, right? They need to trust that the artist knows their audience. They know what will feed and excite culture around them (laughs) and let them guide how the brand is integrated and how it comes to life. It's not natural, right? (laughs) Like if you're a big corporation and you have a brand and you want to protect it, you know, it's your little baby, so to speak. It's not natural. You kind of have to have uh, the right chemistry, I guess, between both parties. 
This has been fun. I, I, I've enjoyed talking to you. We're going to link to a number of these different examples that you, you said. Anything you want to leave people with um, before we switch gears? I have a few other questions to ask you too. I just think that, you know, it's it feels like a really amazing time for brand partnerships. And it's like almost like a renaissance of doing things that are, you know, creatively based. And I feel like, you know, if there's, if, if anyone's listening and they want to explore and need more information or want to just touch base about how to do partnerships, I'm always out there. As I said, I'm an evangelist. So I'm always there to talk about this sort of thing. I, I live and breathe it. And I, I just, you know, it's, it's what I've always wanted to do. I find it so interesting. And as I said, with the advent of all that stuff that's going on in the, in the metaverse, a lot more interesting stuff to come. Let's switch gears. Uh, and I really like to get to know the person behind the microphone, so to speak. And um, my favorite question to ask everyone that comes on the show is, has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? I can't think of an experience, but I would definitely credit my parents. They were very, very important to my upbringing and taught me how to work really hard and all, but also be very creative at the same time. My dad is also a very famous sports writer and he came from nothing and he became quite famous in his field. And so I would, I credit growing up with parents that were not just hardworking intellectuals, but very creative at the same time. I'm just curious having them be professors, did they ever question, you know, this whole notion of like entertainment and music or did they support it? No, they loved it. They knew I was always into music because I was always, as a teenager, like I was just obsessed with music and playing instruments and being in bands. And I think it was almost like a fait accompli. That's where I would end up. I love that. Cool. What advice would you give your younger self if you're starting all over again? I would tell my younger self to chill out. That's what I would say. <laughs> it's all going to come. I tell my older self that now too. Like it's all going to come. Everything happens at the time it's supposed to happen. And like, don't freak out. Don't stress out. I would also say to my younger self, like, I can't, like, I'll give you an example of this, like how into this world and culture I, I was when I was, you know, making my move from advertising at 25 and I got the job. And before I started, I remember the, it was this huge executive, like I think the CEO of, of the label called me and he said, so-and-so is going to call you because they need to talk to you about Mariah Carey. And I was like, oh my God, I'm having a conversation about Mariah Carey. Like to me, just the fact that I was like getting that close to an artist, let alone like now, like I'm backstage and I'm, I don't take any of it for granted. I, I'm grateful. And I, I guess I, so I would, long way of saying, I would tell my younger self that it's all going to come. And just like stick with it and, and stay, stay the path. <laughs> I love that. Well, I, is there a topic you believe marketers need to be learning more about today or you're trying to learn more about yourself? Yeah. As I mentioned, it's all, it's all metaverse NFT stuff. I think, I think we should know what's going on. It's, you know, there's an interesting article today I read this morning about how, and this is, I think where I may lean in because it's such a vast category of stuff. I'll admit it, I am sort of like, a, I, I definitely like my luxury goods. And so the article I read this morning was that the luxury goods space is going to be valued at some crazy number. I don't, don't quote me, it was like $200 million by 2025. And that there's going to be a lot, a lot in the luxury metaverse space. I can't believe I'm even uttering these words out of my mouth. <laughs> But that's that personally, that's what I'm going to try to learn. You've heard you've heard me talk about this stuff a lot today, right? Balenciaga, luxury goods. But I feel like that there's something fascinating there, and I want to try and wrap my wrap my hands around it. Stepping back, are there brands, companies, or causes you follow, or you think other people should take notice of? I'm a big animal rights advocate, and I'm on the board of something called Veterinarians International. So I'm going to just shout it out because we bring uh, vet and veterinarian services to um, underprivileged countries, which is a really wonderful organization. But I mean, I love what, again, I'll, I'll talk about the luxury space again. I really love what, what a lot of the luxury space is doing. I didn't work on this other than clearing the music, but the Tiffany campaign with Beyonce and Jay-Z is absolutely stunning. And I think that luxury brands have done a really good job of adapting. I mean, they were very slow to slow to slow to move, but I think once they caught up, you know, they're really using digital and social mediums in a really incredible way. So I, I have my eye on on those sort of companies and the gorgeous creative that they're developing. Last question: uh, What do you feel like is the largest opportunity or threat to marketers today? You would have asked me this question about a year ago or two years ago. I would have said that influencers were really getting in the way of no offense, legit talent. 
like a lot of budgets. And I knew this when I was a Condé Nast because that's when it had just started. You know, the sort of the YouTube tutorials, YouTube stars, the Instagram influencers. And I feel like luckily that shifted. I think that sort of like the curtain's been pulled back. And I think brands are just allocating because it was sort of like the soup du jour. They're just allocating all their budgets, throwing it all into an influencer bucket. And I would have said that that was a real threat. But I, I think it's I think we've course corrected that. I think it's kind of moving along in the right way. Now, what would I say is a threat? Not understanding digital media is a huge threat. Not understanding how to use content in the right way, not being responsive, not engaging with your audience. I think those are all huge mistakes and a threat because everything's becoming a lot more D to C. Even when I had my call with my friend Oyer yesterday, even they were saying, and I'm noticing this as a trend, that a lot of these monolith brands are really leaning into D to C. And I feel like that's a threat would be not to engage with your audience um, in a timely, opportunistic fashion. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show and educating us about brand partnerships. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with support from my team and podcast editors, sound engineers, and writers at Share Your Genius. Find them at shareyourgenius.com. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. You can contact me on marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you will also find complete show notes, links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.